Hello, welcome to lesson 14 of the Practical OSPF series. In this lesson, we'll be illustrating the OSPF area types. With OSPF, it's commonly said that there are five different OSPF area types. And in this lesson, we're going to look at all five. But in a stricter interpretation, there's actually only three OSPF area types. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that later on in this lesson. Now, to fully understand any OSPF area type, you must already understand OSPF LSAs. Specifically, types 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 LSAs, what's contained in each of them, and who sends what and where they go. If LSAs are not something that you are very familiar with, I would recommend pausing this video and going back and checking out lesson 9 of this series, where we illustrate the different types of LSAs and what's included in each of them. With that out of the way, let me describe the topology that we'll be using in this lesson and all the LSAs that exist in each of these areas. Our topology has four areas, area 0, connected to area 22, 33, and 44. Within this topology, we're going to say that there are 10 IP subnets that exist inside each of these areas, and they're going to be shared within the areas using type 1 and type 2 LSAs. And then each of the ABRs are going to summarize the information in each of those areas to the other areas in the topology. For example, router 2, router 3, and router 4 are each going to be sending 10 type 3 LSAs into area 0, which means in total, area 0 is going to contain 30 type 3 LSAs, one type 3 LSA for each IP subnet that exists in a foreign area. And since there will be one type 3 LSA for every IP subnet in a foreign area, there will also be 30 type 3 LSAs inside area 22, 33, and 44. Consider from the perspective of area 44, there are 10 IP subnets that exist in each of the other three areas. Therefore, there will be 30 type 3 LSAs inside area 44, accounting for each of those IP subnets. Moreover, in our topology, we're going to have router 5 and router 7 do some redistribution. They're going to become ASBRs. They are each going to redistribute 100 subnets into OSPF. Now, the actual protocols that router 5 and router 7 are redistributing is irrelevant to our demonstration. But either way, since they are redistributing them, they're going to appear as type 5 LSAs within OSPF, which means both router 5 and router 7 are each sending 100 type 5 LSAs to account for each of the IP subnets in these redistributed foreign networks. And those type 5 LSAs are going to be sent unchanged throughout the OSPF domain, which means in total there will be 200 type 5 LSAs in each of these areas. That is going to be our starting point for our discussion on OSPF area types. The first type of area that we're going to discuss is what's known as a normal area. And this is actually the default area type, which is to say, if you don't explicitly tell an area that it is one of the other area types, it's going to assume to be a normal area. In a normal area, every type of LSA is allowed. Notice, all of these are normal areas, and in all cases, type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, and type 5 LSAs are allowed to exist inside each of the normal areas. Every further area type we discuss is just going to be an optimization of this type of area. So understand that all these areas start as a normal area. With that in mind, I'm going to introduce you to the next type of area that we're going to discuss, and that is known as a stub area. Take a look at area 33. Look at where area 33 sits in this topology. Notice that for router 6 or any other router that might exist inside area 33, all the traffic, whether it be going to area 22, area 44, area 0, or one of these foreign ASs, is all going towards router 3 regardless. Therefore, is it strictly necessary for area 33 to maintain 200 different routes for the 200 type 5 LSAs that exist? The answer is no. That's the key of what a stub area is. A stub area is just like a normal area, except it doesn't allow type 4 and type 5 LSAs. So these type 5 LSAs would be gone once we made area 33 a stub area. But you still have to account for how will traffic actually get to these foreign redistributed subnets. Right now, with these type 5 LSAs gone, there will be no route for any of those subnets, and therefore all data packets meant for those subnets will be dropped. Instead, what the ABR is going to do on a stub network, 
is it's going to inject a default route via a type 3 LSA. Meaning, router 3 is going to inject a new type 3 LSA for the IP subnet 0.0.0.0/0, and it's going to send that into area 33. Which means currently, area 33 not only has the 30 type 3 LSAs reflecting the 10 subnets in each of the other areas, it is now going to have 31 to account for this new default route that was just sent by router 3. With this default route, all the routers in area 33 will still be able to get to the foreign redistributed subnets that they just lost the route for by losing the type 5 LSAs. So here we've maintained connectivity and spared all the routers inside Area 33 from having to maintain an additional 200 routes from those Type 5 LSAs. That's what a stub area does. It gets rid of the Type 4 and 5 LSAs and replaces them with a single default route injected via a Type 3 LSA by our ABR. So that's the definition of a stub area. But can we go even more optimized than that? Again, take a look at the traffic flow from Area 33. Notice that any traffic leaving Area 33 is going to be going via Router 3, which means whether that traffic is meant to go to Area 22, Area 0, or Area 44, in all cases, it must go through Router 3. Which begs the question, do we actually need to maintain a separate IP route for each of the subnets inside Area 0, 22, and 44 if all of them are pointing towards Router 3? And the answer to that is probably not. And there is an optimization within OSPF you can use known as creating a totally stub area, or also said as totally stubby. I've heard it said both ways. The difference between a stub area and a totally stub area is that a totally stub area goes a step further and also doesn't allow type 3 LSAs. So these 31 type 3 LSAs would get reduced to one LSA, the single type 3 LSA that was injected by the ABR router 3. So we just reduced area 33 from having to maintain 30 type 3 LSAs and 200 type 5 LSAs to simply maintain a single type 3 LSA, which is a default route pointing to the ABR. So you can see how stub areas and totally stub areas are significant optimizations beyond a simple normal area. So again, stub and totally stubby areas are mostly the same. They both allow type 1 and type 2 LSAs. They both disallow type 4 and type 5 LSAs. They both inject a default route via a type 3 LSAs. The only place that they differ is that stub areas do allow type 3 LSAs and totally stub areas do not allow type 3 LSAs. So that takes care of discussing stub and totally stubby areas. But let me draw your attention to area 44 for a minute. Notice where area 44 sits. You might think you could apply those same optimizations making area 4 a stub or totally stubby area. But area 44 includes an ASBR, which is redistributing foreign routes. And those routes are redistributed as a type 5 LSA. So if we made area 44 a stub area or a totally stub area, all those type 5 LSAs would go away, which means there would be no connectivity to these foreign redistributed subnets, not only for area 44, but also for any of the other areas in our topology, since remember, it's router 7 that's initiating these type 5 LSAs. So making area 44 a stub area is not really an option because we are doing redistribution into area 44. There is, however, another option you can use, and that is to make Area 44 what's known as a NSSA, or a not-so-stubby area. It's an area that is sort of stubby, but not entirely. Let me explain. In a not-so-stubby area, Type 1, 2, and 3 LSAs are allowed, and Type 4 and 5 LSAs are not allowed, which means all of these Type 5 LSAs are going to be gone. You'll notice that so far it looks very similar to a stub area, where type 1, 2, and 3 are allowed and 4 and 5 are not allowed. The difference is that in a not so stubby area, redistribution is still allowed using a new type of LSA that we haven't discussed yet in this series. 
And that new type of LSA is known as a type 7 LSA. A type 7 LSA works very similar to a type 5 LSA. It's the LSA that contains IP subnets that have been redistributed into OSPF. But a type 7 LSA can only exist inside a not so stubby area. It's actually how they got around the fact that type 5s are not allowed, but we still want to do redistribution. They created a new type of LSA, which includes the redistributed subnets from the local segment. And you'll only ever see a type 7 LSA inside a not so stubby area. But again, as I just mentioned, they work very similar to a type 5 LSA, in the sense that for every single IP subnet that's being redistributed, you'll also have a type 7 LSA. Meaning, router 7 to redistribute these 100 IP subnets is going to be sending 100 type 7 LSAs into OSBF. That will allow other routers which might exist inside area 44 to receive routes for these foreign subnets and send traffic for those routes to router 7, maintaining connectivity to the IP subnets that exist inside this foreign AS. But how do those type 7 LSAs affect the type 5 LSAs that used to exist that had been redistributed by router 7 before we made it a NSSA. Well, the neat thing about it is that they won't because those type 7 LSAs are actually going to be translated to regular type 5 LSAs by the ABR in front of an NSSA. So the rest of the OSPF topology is still going to have type 5 LSAs to route traffic to the foreign IP subnets that have been redistributed by router 7. So router 7 will send them into the NSSA as type 7 LSAs, and router 4, the ABR, will translate them into type 5 LSAs, and they'll be treated as any regular type 5 LSA in any of the other normal areas in the topology. Again, you'll only see type 7 LSA in a not so stubby area some of you might have realized that there is actually still a problem. Remember, router 5 is redistributing 100 subnets via type 5 LSAs. And those type 5 LSAs should be making their way into area 44. But since area 44 is a not so stubby area, type 5 LSAs aren't allowed. So at the moment, the routers inside area 44 don't have routes for the foreign IP subnets redistributed by router 5. That's a problem that needs to be solved on a case-by-case -case basis. In some cases, you can just tell router 4 to inject the default route, such that all the routers in area 44 will send all traffic that they don't have any route for to a router 4, and then router 4 will send it as necessary. In other cases, you might want the routers in area 44 to use as a default route the ASBR. So since OSPF can't automatically determine the right direction for the default route, it's not going to inject one by default in a not so stubby area. You as the admin need to account for how do you want the routers in area 44 to deal with traffic going to these subnets. So keep that in mind that when you make an area a not so stubby area, you need to figure out a way to maintain connectivity to other foreign ASs that have been redistributed into OSPF. The local foreign AS is accounted for with these type 7 LSAs. So that takes care of discussing NSSA areas. And I know that I just said not so stubby area areas, but I'll probably end up saying that a lot throughout this lesson. And let's be honest, so will you. In any case, that is a not so stubby area. But the question still remains. Is there a further optimization you can do to Area 44? And the answer to that is also yes. Just like we had the option with a stub area to make it a totally stub area, we also have the option to make a not so stubby area a totally not so stubby area. The difference between a totally not so stubby area and a not so stubby area is simply the fact that in a totally not so stubby area, type 3 LSAs are no longer allowed, which means all of these type 3 LSAs accounting for the IP subnets that exist in foreign OSPF areas will be gone. But in the case of a totally not so stubby area, a default route will be injected by the ABR via a type 3 LSA. So router 4 in this example will be sending a type 3 LSA 
using the default route so that the other routers inside Area 44 will know to send any traffic for these foreign subnets to Router 4. And you'll notice that that will also take care of the prior problem that I mentioned with a not so stubby area of how to get to Router 5's redistributed subnets. Since we have a default route, any traffic that the routers inside Area 44 don't have a specific route for will just be sent to Router 4. And then Router 4, which does have the Type 5 LSAs sent by Router 5, will take that and send it to the right router. So that's an option you have with not so stubby areas, is to make it a totally not so stubby area, in which case it'll deny the Type 3 LSAs, but inject a single Type 3 LSA as a default route. And that takes care of talking about all five of the OSBF area types. We talked through normal areas, stub areas, totally stub areas, not so stubby areas, and totally not so stubby areas. So now I'd like to bring you back to something I said earlier in this lesson, where I told you that there's actually only three different area types. And why I say that has to do with hello packets. So back in lesson three, we unpacked hello packets. And I told you that there are things inside hello packets that routers must agree on in order to become neighbors with each other. One of those things is the area type flag. And I want to show you the area type flag using a packet capture. This packet capture comes from lesson six. In that lesson, I gave you a packet capture of DRs and BDRs sending router advertisements to each other. The actual packet capture itself doesn't really matter. I just wanted to take a look at a hello packet. Now, if we look inside a hello packet, in this case, we're looking at packet number 11. We've expanded the hello packet and expanded the options field. You'll see these two options. These two flags are the flags that are used to indicate what area type a router believes itself to be in. We have the N bit, which stands for NSSA, and the E bit, which stands for external routing. If you see a one on the E bit, that indicates that external routing is allowed in that area. And by external routing, we mean type five LSAs, which are known as external LSAs. And if you'll notice, there's only one type of area that allows external routing, that allows type 5 LSAs, and that's normal areas. Which means if you see a 1 in the E bit, then you have a normal area. Which brings us to the N bit. The N bit is pretty straightforward. It stands for NSSA. And if you have a 1 here, you have an NSSA area. And if you have a 0 here, you don't have an NSSA area. So the combination of the N bit and the E bit are what indicate what type of area an OSPF router thinks itself to be in. If you see a one in the E bit and a zero in the N bit, then you know you are in a normal area. If you see a zero in the E bits, this tells you you must be in an area that doesn't allow type five LSAs. And if you have a zero in the N bit, this tells you you're in a stub area. And if you have a one in the end bit, this tells you you are in a not so stubby area. It's not expected that you'll ever see a one in both of these bits. That would be considered a malformed or potentially corrupted hello packet. So as you can see, with these two flags, there's only three combinations for areas, normal, stub, and NSSA. So what exactly is these totally stubby and totally not so stubby areas? Well, all they are is additional options you can turn on on the ABR in front of a stub or NSSA area. And I'm going to show them to you in the next lesson. In the next lesson, we're going to go through the configuration of normal, stub, and not so stubby areas. And I'm going to show you the additional options you would turn on to enable totally stub and totally not so stubby areas. And I'm also going to show you a few other options that also exist. But that will all be saved for the next lesson. With that said, we bring this lesson to a close. The main takeaways from this lesson is understanding the five different OSBF area types, the LSAs that exist in each, and the optimization that they each provide. In the next lesson, we're going to be looking at the configuration of the different area types. I'm going to show you the options that you would enable to configure totally stub and totally NSSA areas. I'll also show you a few additional options beyond just the totally options. 
If you enjoyed this lesson, then do me a favor, post a link to this series somewhere online to help me bring more attention to this content. I've created a simple sharing link you can use, and that is pracnet.net slash OSBF. Otherwise, thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you in the next one.